um, find equational proof shouldn't be de-experimentalized. Okay. Well, let me read the argument. Now, a prototype theorem proof for all first order logic. Okay. Yeah, I don't understand why predicate wouldn't be part of equational logic. I mean, it. Or yeah, is it not? That, that's that's the current plan. So we're, the the function that was called find predicate proof, uh, we're now integrating into find equational proof for twelve point one. Okay. And so what aspect to find equational proof should be considered experimental still? I mean, that integration, does it affect the design of find equational proof? It affects the design of the... Oh, hi. Hi. Hi there. Uh, I, what, I, it affects the design of the proof object slightly because we have to add... I mean, there are essentially two new kinds of proof step that we're going to be adding. So what? I mean, that doesn't... That would not blow up the experimentalizing it. I mean, in the sense that... That's just adding functionality. It does not affect, it does not invalidate the existing design. I mean, is that? There's also an argument that we shouldn't de-experimentalize until we know what's going on with the lean project. But Jose is probably the right person to make that argument. Jose, what would you have to say about that? Well, that's still far in the future. Um, I think there is a part of proof object which is rather stable, the fact that it has these first three arguments and then the fourth one is very general. We can put whatever we want there. What is the form of proof object? Well, I don't remember its argument structure. Yes, so there are two arguments which are obvious, which are the, the theorem you are trying to prove, the axioms to start with. And then uh, the first one is the logic you are using to... to uh, I mean, we're not documenting. We're documenting properties of proof object. We're not documenting the internal structure of the proof object here. Are we? Uh, no, I probably not, but, but still... I mean, yeah. it, I'm, I'm thinking that the, with respect to proof object, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly sure we have this right structure given that the last argument is very general. Okay, well, oh. wait, let's, let's look at what this is. So, yeah. the fact that I'm seeing functions with names like manage crocodile is odd. But anyway, okay, so what is this here? Um, proof object, predicate logic. So, that's the base axiom system. That's the logic we are using to uh, for the proof, to, to construct the proof from the uh, from the actions. So, what what are the other things that could be in there? Um, well, um, for example, we want to add there the synthetic logic for uh, synthetic geometry. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure what the name is going to be, but. What is the difference? I understand. This is the logic that's being used. I don't understand how that relates to... What do you mean by that? I mean, how does it relate to the axiom system? Yeah, well, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, so... The... Um, the form in which we write the axiom system and the theorem we want to prove will depend on the on that first argument, it has to match that because that's that the, that first argument will tell us what we can expect and what we will do to construct the proof. Okay, but explain what to me what, what's the difference between the synthetic geometry thing? I mean, they're all a bunch of statements that are asserted to be true and so on. What's the difference between that and the predicate logic case? Well, in the predicate logic case, we only accept equalities and uh, and uh, the, 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 the functions and symbols we will be using there. While in the synthetic logic case, we will be accepting a larger variety of things. And what other cases are there? Well, I, mean, in the I, don't, I don't understand why, why the assertion 
what's part of the base logic and what's part of the axioms? So, I mean, saying something is on the midpoint, you know, this is on the midpoint of, uh, is at the midpoint of that. Seems like in the case of predicate logic, that would just be a managed crocodile type function, so to speak. What's the difference between managed crocodile and is at the midpoint of? Well, they don't handle everything via equalities, for example. They can have, they can have statements of other types. So predicate logic would not be able to handle those. Okay, but, but in the case of... I don't see equalities here either for all... Right. So I, I think it's worth noting that there's a, there's a subtlety in the, in the predicate logic case, which is that there's a mismatch between the logic that you use to define the axioms in the theorem and the logic that's actually used for the proof. Because the way that the predicate logic prover works is you, you give it something in first order logic, and then it will convert it into some equisatisfiable thing in equational logic, and then it will prove that. And so the, so the, the, the actual proof is, is purely equational. But the logic for the that was used to specify the axioms in the theorem is first order. So wait a minute. When we look at but so the logic, the specification logic here is the same as the synthetic geometry specification logic, correct? Because that's also first order, is it or is it not? I mean, you could convert it to that. I I, I don't know. I mean, right now the, the the way that the synthetic geometry works doesn't involve converting it into first order. Um, although it could, like we, we could use sort of Tarski's axioms or something. Um, I'm confused. I mean, so in the current case, the geometry, yeah, the geometry is not using for all and there exists. It's what is it using instead of those? It's implicitly saying that, isn't it? I'd say so. I think it's, it's all so. uh, implicit, yes. They have a variety of... of points and uh... and what it's saying is for all points a such that blah 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 this is true right right mm -hmm. okay but in terms of what jonathan was saying that first argument says the proof sorry the logic we used to construct the proof not the logic in which the statements are written because that, that should be readable from the statements themselves. Yes. Well, unless we want to carry around with the statements some, something about the logic in which they're supposed to be. I mean, it's not self-evident that there are no doubt degenerate cases of some fancier logic that look like a different kind of logic if you just look at the statement. Right. So, I mean, like one thing we discussed was having, uh, as part of the proof object, having an axiom logic and a proof, lo a proof logic that are not necessarily the same. Boy, that's pretty weird. But yes, I understand that. I mean, there's also the statement is made. Okay, so what you're saying is the statement is made with respect to one kind of logic. Then the proof could be done in another kind of logic. Oh boy. Okay. This is kind of weird. I think you're just trying to confuse me enough that we'll have to agree to not de-experimentalize this stuff. Um, all right. I mean, I guess that's okay. I, you know, fine. All right. We'll leave it experimental for another version. Um, I mean, it's just, we should consider that we have some pressure to de-experimentalize. We don't just want to leave things experimental for, for ages. All right, okay, fine. All right, consider that. Anybody want to disagree with that conclusion? Not me. Okay. All right, so be it. Okay, I think, is that everything for Jonathan? It's welcome to stick around, but um, uh, that's probably everything there. Thanks. Okay. See you later. Do you want to move up to around first the numbers with uncertainty because Jose is here? Fine. Okay. Oh, you want to keep this experimental? Why? I, absolutely. Yes. So I have a stronger opinions on this one than the previous one. So here I've seen users quite happy about the functions. Uh, because they can do now what they had to do, what they need to do at university, etc. The main complaint about around 
is, is the handling of the nonlinear case. So a round was constructed on the idea that you want, you are interested in the propagation of errors linearly, as it's mm -hmm. typically used in the formulas. So most of the complaints I've received are things like, oh, it, it fails at the um, stationary points of trigonometric functions, or it fails at the cusp of a, a absolute function, absolute value function, this type of thing. So somehow users expect some sort of blend between this linear propagation error and a very strict interval propagation. What do they mean by fails? Okay, so, so let me just try to understand what you're talking about. So you're saying that if yes. I were to... Try something like um, cosine of a round of zero plus something. So we are differentiating at the, at the maximum of cosine. Okay, zero uh, with plus minus point three or something. Right. What the heck is that? I exactly. So because the That's crazy. Yes, but you see, the problem is here that at that point we have derivative zero. So the standard formulas of propagation of errors will say, well, because the derivative is zero, the error is zero. Okay, but stripping the around and not leaving, I understand. I understand the issue. But well, th that's a different different thing. So a round of three plus minus zero should mean just the number zero. So if I say like pi over two here. Right. So okay. at other points is fine. But I mean, if you just say a round of one comma zero, it will just say, oh, you mean the number one. This, this, this was done just to avoid having a new representation of a number. Because otherwise a round of one comma zero is a number. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is wrong. I, I think that... Yes, so, so that's my point. We should do something more intelligent there. But of course, that would be a breakage with the standard formulas. So we would have to somehow explain, well, we are not using the standard well, formulas. I understand. The, the standard formula would say this is one plus or minus zero. Is that correct? Y yes, yes. Which, which but it's zero, zero because, I see, because it's first order errors. Exactly. But I mean, if I say, <clears throat> so you can go I take to higher order. Case. No, but look, look, look. I mean, if I say plus or minus four or something here, that's just crazy because I mean that actual value could be anything between minus one and one. But but and now you see now you are thinking in terms of interval propagation. Mm -hmm. And so th that that's what I mean. So we have these two paradigms. And they do different things in the in the nonlinear cases. So we need to find out. What, what happens if I have a higher order, if I go to higher order here? How do I, how do I specify that? Yes, you would have to use a, the second argument of a round replace. So you say uh, a round replace, because by default, propagation is, all, is always order one. So you say exactly a round replace, cosine, and then x goes, um, um, yes. And I think that, so yes, x goes to a round of 0, 0,3, and then the third argument would be a 2 or 3. Let's use 3, for example. Right. So let's do something which is closer to what users expect, but of course they have to go through this. And I've prepared this. But, but, but the, the answer here is absolutely bonkers. Look at the answer. Yes, it's still, it's still bad because that's what the formulas to order three give. If you keep increasing this to order infinity, they would give better and better results. Order, I mean, we have formulas up to order four because these formulas are, are hardwired. But, but even that's pretty bonkers, right? I mean, in... in um... Yes, yes. So, so I'm, I'm not defending this. I'm, I'm just explaining how it works and why users have complained. And I, I understand. So, so I understand we need something else, but I just, I don't know what it is. How to blend continuously these two interval propagation? Okay, so one thing is a first order effect. And the issue is at what point or nth order, you know, ex expansion. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is at what point does the Taylor expansion break down, basically? Right. Because in a sense, what they want is infinite order, which is just going to transform distribution. But then 
of course, in most cases, we cannot do it. I understand, but I mean, the, the, the issue is, I see, the, the issue is, even in the case where the error is quite small, they're still going to be unhappy with cosine just turning into one, I think. Well, we could, we could uh, leave the around 1,0, but, but that, that could create problems somewhere else. But yeah, we can look into that. Well, around 1,0 point might create less problems than zero, <coughs> than, than <coughs> pure zero, right? I, I see what you mean. Zero, distinguishing zero point from zero. Yeah. Um, does, is Rob here? And does Rob have an opinion about this? Uh, no, I don't think. It's I'm to be here, a... but I wasn't really listening. OK. Oh. Yeah, so we are talking about uh, error propagation in around and the, and the fact that it follows the statistical formulas, not the interval propagation formula. So it just looks at the first few derivatives at a point rather than trying to limit intervals. Which means that in the case of cosine, because the first derivative is zero, it thinks that the error, you know, it thinks that the error is zero. So people who've done error propagation in, um, you know, standard kind of, um, what do they do with this? I mean, do they just get this wrong? Well, if you go to the standard documents, like the GAM document, the Guide of Uncertainty by the ISO mm -hmm. standards, they express the, the first order formulas. And then they say, if you need to go higher, here you have the second order formula. And then they leave it at that. Well, what, what is the second order? Okay, so, so in other words, they get it wrong. They, they get it wrong as well, yeah. So that's why I went farther and com computed and hardwired fourth, up to fourth order formula. Because you get something, but it's still very wrong. But it's still bonkers. I mean, that, yes, that yes. result is just completely crazy. Yes, yes, but I mean, at least it's a result we can go, if users ask what is that result, we can tell, okay, it's this formula. It's reproducible. If we do something else, which I'm happy to do, we have to decide what it is and how to explain it. Now it goes up to four. I, I don't have formulas beyond four. I, I'm not. I'm not doing that. I, my n is not the n you think it is. I'm oh, just I using see, the. I, I should Sorry. call it d. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so that's the successive errors. As we increase the input error, mm -hmm. that's the output error for the second order formulas for a round. Right, because, and these are probably parabolas. They are just the parabolas corresponding to. So if we do third order, it looks the same because there's a second derivative and presumably fourth order will start to see a difference because there's a non-vanishing fourth derivative. Is that correct? I, I, I think so, yeah. Actually, these are good examples. We should, we should capture these examples. Yeah, for... but, but can I make a comment here? Sure. I mean, the, the whole, this whole first order, second order, third order thing, I mean, by the time you get to deviations of size greater than one, that doesn't mean anything. Yes. Yes, well, but you could say so that's that's users error in the sense of being computing something that doesn't make much sense, but they still want to compute. Well, they, they, look, they, they measure some random poorly measured thing in particle physics where they only have three events to determine whether some, you know, dark matter particle exists or something. And then they feed that through a cosine and suddenly the thing turns the three events that they had with huge errors and makes it a precise value, and then everything goes to hell. See what I'm saying? Yes. That's the bad thing. The bad thing is that you're being, you're being falsely, because it's first order, even though the error is very big, you're being lulled into, I mean, clearly we can know there's a problem. Okay, so here's a way to think about it. Take the around, put it in the cosine, and look at the interval values that you get out. 
right? We clearly can know what the values were at the ends of the interval from the around, right? If those interval values are, I mean, okay, th there's then a predicted value from the derivative formalism, from the series expansion, right? Yep. Okay, so if those are way different, something is wrong. In other words, if the, if the derivative formalism says the value should be 1, but the interval formalism says the value should be 0.8 or something, or minus 0.5 or something like this, then you know there's a problem. I mean, I don't know, you know, so in other words, the way you could merge it is by saying, look at the interval, see what the values are at the interval, compare those with the values you get from the series formalism. And if they are more different than something, then I don't know exactly what you do, but then probably what you do is you round up the interval case, uh, round up the, the, um, the series case to blend in a certain amount of the interval value. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that's a, that's a way of smoothly interpolating between, in other words, you can say there's a critical value, possibly a critical value or possibly some sort of blend-in type thing where, you know, there's a deviation. There's an implied deviation at the endpoints of the interval, at the endpoints of the error bar. There's an implied deviation from the value, right, um, in, in the output from the function. And the question then is, what... Uh, you know, how do those implied deviations agree between series and interval? And I would claim there's probably an optimal way, if we think about it, sort of some optimal, well, what's the obvious way to blend those things? So, I mean, clearly, it would be, is there a, is there a value to having consistency? Yeah, there's probably some value to having consistency, and this is only the case, I mean, arguably, okay, so what would happen if there was a message generated in the case where the interval is too far off from the series? Is that well, obviously I, wrong? I, I do think we need some sort of blending of the type you are suggesting. My, my worry is that because this will be use, used by by some students who have to follow strictly some formulas, they may get some results sometimes which do not agree with the formulas they so expect. So give them a message. So give them a message saying, um, you know, the, the um, uh, using something else because the interval would give a stupid result. I mean, because the, the series would give a stupid result. Okay. Going beyond first order because First order would be, I mean, I don't know exactly how we want to say it, but essentially what it boils down to is first order would be misleading. I see. I see. So somehow, rather than saying that the default is order one, we say that the default is automatic and we choose it for you. That's correct. But if we only do that, if it's going to be a stupid result, right? So in other words, I think the only case that we should really error out on is the case where we're going to give a zero is this case of flat derivative, right? I, I think this is the only, to my from what I can see here, this is the only totally misleading case, is the case where we go from and around to a naked number. I, for example, there are, error, there are users complaining about around not handling discontinuities, like in around in, in a step function. And these are cases of, for what the heck are you supposed to do in that case? Exactly, exactly. So, or there are. What do they want it to do? I mean, if they're complaining, they probably say it should do this. Uh, the, 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 they always expect interval arithmetic. So, the exact. You, you need to be aware. They expect us to be aware of the jump and make a round respond to exactly to the jump. Well, yeah, I can't tell that. I mean, the cosine thing also seems. I'll just. But in here, the cosine thing also seems wrong in that you're not getting, I mean, you know, cosine is not symmetric around zero. It's it's always less than or equal to one. Right. So what's your point? My my point is that the interval given shouldn't shouldn't exceed one. But that's not what you get in the first order formalism. First order formalism is blind to the fact that there's a, you know, the 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 domain of the function is limited. 
Yeah, fine. I'm just saying, if we if we go beyond the first order formalism, we should we should incorporate the domain of the function as well, or the range of the function as well. Yeah, range. The mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, gets, I agree. It gets complicated. So right now, the, so we can describe asymmetric uh, errors with a run, but right now, they do not do not appear automatically. So again, here we will be saying we will introduce them with when needed. Well, look, the fact is, if we generated an error, a message, in the case where there's a zero derivative, or the case where within the, uh, you know, within the range described by a round, there is a discontinuity in the function, both of which things we know, then that would go a long way to solving this problem, I think. Well, yes, but, but for example, if I take a round of, you know, cosine X around of say, you know, one tenth comma three, you're still centering yourself around that, around that zero derivative point. I mean, I don't understand how the formalism works, but you still- Well, that's what the formalism says, you do. I mean, the formalism okay. is, is what it is. And, I, you know, the trouble is there's a slippery slope because, you know, you, not, you don't even know in the input, uh, you know, it's, yes, you don't know from the input what they mean when they say plus minus whatever. You know, they certainly didn't know that it was a Gaussian distribution and, and have all these special properties. It's mm -hmm. just this, this vague statement of you know, one, one plus or minus point two or something. Um, all right. Anyway, I think we should probably have a separate meeting about this. But I think that, I mean, my take is if we can at least detect when something is going horribly wrong and generate a message, that will be a significant part of the battle. Doing something better automatically would also be good. But by the time there's a message, people know there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all right, fine, don't de experimentalize, but hopefully by the next version we will be able to de experimentalize that. Look at this, this is another one where it's being recommended to keep it experimental. Okay, Rob, why do you want to keep n body simulation experimental? Okay, so basically, I think, you know, I think the, the, the proper implementation of this uses a, a fast multipole method. Yes. Well, we don't, so. we don't have a fast multipole method. Okay, but so what? I mean, so the experimentalization or not is not a question of what the implementation is. It's a question of what the design is. So is there something wrong with the design? Uh, I haven't seen too many complaints about the design. The, the, the other aspect that's, that's missing is we basically have this very limited set of, you know, set of, Force set of potentials and stuff. Yeah. Which requires yeah. somebody with physics knowledge, like you know, like a Michael type person, to to fill in. Well, I understand that, but these are limitations. These are not, you know, design problems. Yeah, but but do we do we unexperimentalize a function that that works horribly slowly? Yes, I mean, by horribly, it's very usable. It's slower than you would like it to be. I mean, we should get these fast multipole things. We've talked about that multiple times before. We really, really need to get those. But, um, I, you know, it's a question. Um, uh, yeah. Um, Well, okay. Um, I don't see why we shouldn't de-experimentalize it, if, unless you think there's a problem with the design. I don't think, let me just look at the, let me see what box. Well, okay, you know what, you know what, we should leave it for now. I mean, I, but, but for goodness sake, let's try and make it by the next version, let's try and make sure that we have looked at this and hopefully we will have some fast multipole capability by then. Yeah, it would be, yeah, I think, I, I don't know, you know, I mean, I, I wouldn't mind looking at that, working on that. Good, take but a look at it. I, I've got other things to do too, which. I understand, I understand, but can you at least scope out how difficult it is? 
Um, sure. Or do you already know the answer to that? I think it's I think it's moderately difficult. Okay. All right. You know what? The most important thing would be scope it out to the point where we can do a design and then make sure that that design does not uh, tangle with the existing design of n-body simulation. If it doesn't, then I think we can de-experimentalize n-body simulation. Okay, fine. Once, um, once we know the path to getting the faster implementation. Okay. That's okay. Fair enough. Okay. Let's go back. Okay. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Jose. I think that's it for both of you. And okay, then we bye. lose the background noise as well. Okay. Thanks, guys. Bye. Okay. Let's start at the top now. Oh, boy. Really? Has anybody actually used these and had them work? Um. What do you mean? Like, I mean, it works, but... Every time I try to use it, it gets tangled up. Oh, right, yes. So here's the thing. I have redone the back end of this, actually. So now it is... Do you want me to go into details or... Yeah, so say, when uh, she Okay. So here are a couple of issues. IMAP as a protocol is we don't have any good stuff to parse the messages that are coming from IMAP. Okay. So, which made it a little bit difficult. So I was trying to do clever things like look at the envelope, parse it, blah, blah, blah. And the result is that if we just get the whole message, if you download the whole message, things work a lot better because we have EML input that is very robust, um, as far as I can tell. I mean, it has some issues with HTML and whatnot, but overall, it is quite solid. And uh, now we have also implemented caching systems. So once you download a message or you request a message, it is there on the disk. Okay, uh, can I ask a question? Yes. Do you know if Roger is using this capability for my mail process? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Because I haven't told him that it is already there, so. No, no, but I mean the whole system. Is it being used for processing my mail or not? No. Okay. That doesn't uh, give me huge confidence because I know well, that there are things that we wanted to do that um, for which we thought this was going to be a solution. I think it is a much better solution now. So if he gets a new build and starts using it, it will be extremely, and especially in the front end, it actually now provides you with a somewhat of a feedback what it is doing in the back end. So you're not just waiting for it without any knowledge that if something is happening or not, you see, because we are downloading messages and there was no feedback. So you see, you had this concept of functions returning progress indicators, functions that take a while. And this okay, is- So if I do, I just connect it to my mail server. Okay. okay. And if I do something, if I want to go into a particular folder, what do I do? Uh, percent inbox. No, I don't want the inbox. I want uh, to whatever your name is, take whatever junk, if you have a junk folder. No, I'm talking about, I, so I do it with the slashes and everything. Uh, no, you just need to give it the name. That is no, 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 no. I've got a folder that's called to do slash something slash something. Yeah, then you'd have to give it that name. Okay. So I say, oh, come on. Isn't there a mail folder list that gives you all yes, the- Yes, I, I, I've got the mail folder list. Okay. And I'm doing, Well, so for example, here, I've got some, some folders here. Yes, so you could just copy, paste, 
that, yeah. I, I did that. I did and that. I and did it didn't not work. work. Right, so I'll take this one. No, actually, I want to take this one. Okay. I okay. say percent 12 could not be found. Well, it sure looked like it was there. Okay. Uh, there is a mail folder association property. Could you grab that? I, I'll take a look at it. Maybe I, I can do something better over there. That's going to give me for every one of my. Yes, and then you can just save it and get the folder out of it if it's not working by just giving out. Okay. Okay. Okay, so there I've got a mail folder. Yes, and. Uh, now, what depending on what build it is, I only put it in. This is the, this one. is a 12.0 build. Okay, in 12.0 is rubbish. Uh, sorry, um, um, but you can do percent one, and it will grab you the first email in that. Yeah. Okay. But now in 12.1, it actually saves it and what if it's big and has giant attachments I, uh, the attachments can't be more than two, 20 megabytes i believe and well, not it, in our particular mail system i don't know what it is for other people's mail systems but i all the major ones have some limitations to it and uh, Yes, it will save it to the disk, and that's a good thing because you're going to have to work on it. And mm -hmm. I, I don't see it was harder to just figure out what the right thing to do is than doing the simple thing and moving forward with it. Right. Okay. Look, I think we need to. Okay, we had had, for example, okay, a thing I want to do is when there's a mail thread. For, for instance, visualizing the threads in my mail. Can we do that from this? It is completely built on EML import. So if EML import can do it, this can do it also. No, no, no. I'm asking the practicality of, you know, as a practical matter, if I've got a thousand pending mails, can I visualize the thread structure of those pending mails? As a practical matter. Or will it take you know six years to do it? It can do it in a practical amount of time. Okay. Okay. Let me ask another question. If I've got, uh, let's see, this is not, I guess, an active mailbox question. What is this question? I mean, when I've sent somebody a piece of mail and they don't respond, and they should respond, right? We run a classifier. It says the mail I sent to them is something which asks for a response. Uh, we wait X amount of time, a week. They don't respond. Um, you know, can we tell that? What, how would we tell that? Is that from here or is that more from the, um, uh, you know, from something that has to look at a mail archive? It will have to be something that looks at the mail archive. Otherwise, I mean, you can check for flags, but otherwise, what happens on your end? But I, I, this is. No, no, I understand. But what I'm looking for is, let's imagine. No, no, no. In my sent mail folder, right, is a mail message. Okay. Yes. It says, um, hey, Fahim, can you figure out this and that? Yes. Okay. Then we should be able to do the logic of figuring out that, no, I didn't get a response to that message. The machine learning classifier says that message is one that asks for a response. Yep. OK? OK. But you know, so the question is, something like that, is it doable with this, or is it going to get all tangled up? Right, so I mean, that would be an automatic thing that runs, oh, I don't know, a couple of times a day that goes and snarfs in stuff from the sent messages, right? Mm -hmm. and, and probably things that are a year old are dead meat. Nothing's going to happen with them, right? Yes. So it's got to have some logic 
And I think that would be a good example. I mean, can you think of another example of a, I mean, that would be a good test case, which is also would happen to be very useful to me at least. Right. And uh, with this, I think it will be the way the caching works and the fact that it is all organized. Yes, it, it should be very easy nowadays. Okay, right. let's try it. Okay, so let's because we it. do caching, yes, now it is possible. Okay. Well, so maybe maybe you can work with Roger to see if you can get that to to happen. That, that's and, fine. I, if he has any, it should be working. Yes. I think that the um the main thing I I don't know whether we did have some effort to make a classifier for messages that require a response. Okay. Okay. I I mean I definitely. I can... think uh, we can do that probably for external messages. Um, there's a pretty decent heuristic that if, if there's an external message sent, um. It is very likely that it, it requested a response. Yeah. Fair. Okay, so let's try that before we de experimentalize this stuff, because I'm I'm not convinced yet. Okay, fair enough. Um Okay, now you're also on for cookie management, is that correct? Yes. Oh for goodness sake. What what is happening here? What I mean nothing is happening here. It has been dead for however since we introduced it. Uh the idea behind it was that dollar cookie store is a file based record system so multiple kernels we we didn't have a proper answer for it what happens if there are because it's actually a file and if you have multiple kernel sessions then read and write might cause an issue but i'm not so there's no atomicity to the cookie store yeah ugh Okay, so so wait a second. So so the issue is when URL read reads something, it is reading, it is getting cookies saved during yes. that reading process. Yes. And the question is where is where is that where are those cookies? Because it's an indirect operation. URL read does what it does, and indirectly it's saving away cookies. Right. Okay, and the challenge is, um, where does it put those cookies? Yes, and that we depend on. So this is not a home-baked system, the cookie store. It, we borrow it from libcurl, which is the underlying library for it. Okay, but fine. But it, it's but so it doesn't have atomicity either. No. Okay. And what is the relationship between the cookie store and a persistent value? Like if I wanted to put the cookie store in my, if I wanted to really persist it across my whole account by having it in the cloud and so on, is that a realistic thing to want to do? Probably not, just because of the security issues. Uh, but avoiding that, I, I think it would be hard to do that, um, but not impossible. I, I just have not thought all the details. so. Okay, so the issue is multiple kernels reading in the same account, writing cookie store data that you know stomps on top of it other ones. Yes. What a mess. I mean, I, I, the, clearly there's some hacks for getting out of uh, The uh, right thing to do is uh, database systems that can be accessed by multiple applications and whatnot. Well, uh, right, which we're about to have. Right. So maybe, so maybe cookie store should eventually turn into an entity store, which is backed by a database. I mean, it's very elaborate for something that's rather obscure. Uh, precisely. And so we have sort of, I mean. All right, fine. Leave it as experimental for now. So okay. the dependency there will be once this can be. So the, the answer, but by the way, I'm sorry, we, we failed to implement the thing that we were supposed to implement here, which is the, uh, Raj, were you not around for this? The, the writing the sentences that explain why something is being left experimental. We are coming up with the system to do so. Um, I'm just finalizing that with Brian. So okay, fine. it isn't in place yet, but it will be for the next next. Okay, so so I mean, for example, for this, you know, for n body, we should say um, we're not experimentalizing it pending uh, faster underlying algorithms, which might change the design. For theorem proving, we should say we're not experimentalizing because um, it's pending uh, understanding the relationship between axiom systems and base logics. 
numbers with uncertainty, we should say we're not experimentalizing because of this point that we can explain to do with uh, zero derivative you know, functions or, or discontinuous functions, okay? Male functionality, we're not de-experimentalizing because uh, we feel it hasn't been adequately tested in the wild. Right, I'll, I'll maintain separate notes, but we'll also have a per function, you know, the reasons documented in the documentation page as you requested. Fine. Okay, I don't know what connection settings even is. What is it? It's an option. Oh boy, why is it? So, what? What? I mean, it seems like a reasonable thing. Although I don't know whether the name connection settings. I mean, I think we intended that to be a more general thing that, interestingly, could be used. I mean, something like this could be reused in connection with throttling API usage and things, couldn't it? Max download speed, max upload speed. I, I don't, maybe, maybe not, but I mean, those, the, that, this class of names. Okay, so for example, uh, a question for cloud objects. Maybe there should be a connection settings for cloud objects that defines these things as well. So if somebody has a one gigabyte cloud object, um, you can define, you should be able to define for users what the max download speed of that is and so on. Maybe that's the wrong set of people in this meeting, but can can somebody take that to, I guess it's Joel and Matt, who are thinking about cloud object and um, all of the various permissions related restrictions on cloud objects, okay? They're also thinking about the, the abuse blocking for cloud objects, user controllable abuse blocking. Yes? I've made a note, yes. Okay, very good. All right, okay, next up. This, there's no way this one is going to escape here. By the time you got a, a decimal bison running around. No, this, this is before we talked about that last uh, last Thursday. Then I, I talked to Carlo, and uh, he's out at the beginning of this week. We are trying to see if we can fit the, um, the whole Mongo thing into the entity framework. It's a bit difficult because the whole Mongo thing is no SQL. I understand. And I mean, I, but I think the future is, if it's going to be widely used in the system, that's what we have to do. The yep. only question is for this, you know, is there a Mongo, um, oh, for goodness sake, this is so pathetic. This search is so pathetic. Can, can you report that bug as well? I can, yeah. Um, so, I mean, the issue is for something like this, Mongo collection name. I mean, I have no idea whether this package is mature. I mean, the, I guess that the, the, this, this package is a one-to-one -one correspondence to the Mongo uh, interface, the, the official Mongo interface. So yeah. the point is that is do we want to build something on top of this? If so, then this is mature yes. because this has everything already. Do we want to change this? I guess this is the point. Do we want to change this? We don't know. We... And we, we won't know until we've tried to build something on top of it. I mean, we, for example, we built something on top of that. It was an ML data framework. It works fairly well. I understand we... that. I understand that. We, we are currently trying to productize that. Yep. Right. So let's wait until we productize that to de-experimentalize this. Okay, and maybe we also wait till we, I have the proper thorough discussion with Carlo Barbieri about uh, how to integrate this with the entity store, if ever we can. He's not away because I had a meeting with him this morning, but anyway, who knows? No, no, um, he's away. I talked to him last, last week. No, okay, so. all right, okay, <laughs> fine. All right. Then who was I talking to this morning? I was talking to him. Anyway, I'm confused. doesn't really matter. What, what did you ask him? I, we we had a meeting about databases this morning. Oh yeah, but I mean, he he told me like, oh, we're going to discuss this next week because I don't have time now. Oh okay, fine. Oh, he doesn't have time. Okay, fine. No. Um, okay, okay. Well, sadly, uh, yet another non-de-experimentalized thing. Um, and I think uh, for these packages, it, it's it's. Um, do we need to explain why we're not de-experimentalizing packages? That's sort of a policy issue. 
let's not I, I don't think we should uh, unless we have something interesting to say i don't think we should need to need to express an opinion about that <sighs> all right scheduled tasks oh for goodness sake okay so we have constant in here do we have anybody else representing scheduled tasks do we have constant in here yes i'm here yeah You want to leave the whole thing experimental? Okay. Um, for various reasons. And to wit, what are the reasons? So, um, local submit, it has to have an option, uh, a way to initialize the kernel. A simple, simple thing that uh, if, you, if you want to counter, Incre uh, so the task evaluates the increase of the counter x plus plus, but you need to set the initial value, and there is no way. I'm sorry. So you're saying there is a design imperfection in this? Yes. So for example, you do local submit of x plus plus, which should increase the value, but you have no way to initialize x. Okay. So wait a minute. So this is a design flaw, but I mean, why hasn't this come up in the discussion of just design for, for tasks in general? It did not come up in session submit because you share all the namespace. Uh, so passing down, passing the the value to the different. But certainly, tasks. cloud submit it would come up in. Could be didn't yeah. Why not? I mean, it's the same issue. I mean, if I say cloud submit x plus plus, it could just go bonkers. Um, yeah, it, I think it was oversight. It's quite an easy thing. Okay, so what is your proposal for how to do the design for the initializer? Um, maybe it should have an option initialize or something like that. Uh, what we do for um, manipulate or other things? Well, what do we do there? We, well, what we do there is, what do we do? Initialization. Fair enough. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what you're proposing then is that, uh, let's say, cloud submit. I don't understand this. I don't understand. Why isn't the initialization just part of the expert here? Oh, uh, no, look at the second line. Um, Submits a task to evaluate on yes, that so schedule. Yes, so export gets evaluated on a schedule, but there is you cannot you have to pass some values that the task can use. Well, what are you talking about? I'm sorry, I don't understand. If if x is x plus plus, yeah, this is a crazy thing anyway. In what this, does this mean? What what does local submit of x plus plus possibly mean? It's a counter. You just let the other, you just let it evaluate somewhere else. But how can X be persistent? How would you persist X unless you use persistent value to do it? For as long as task is running, uh, X is there and it is persistent. But you said local submit of a particular function. Oh, I see, in the task. In the You're task. persisting it in the task. Yeah. How on earth does that? You can you can have the task report the value back, but how well, does it work in the cloud when there's a task? I don't understand this. So the task object comes back, but hasn't aren't all the resources associated with the execution of that task? They are gone in the cloud when you exit, aren't they? Yes, but for as long as task is running. You can still. Well, what does it mean running? I mean, it could be running for a year, but only wake up once a month, couldn't it? Yeah, could be, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, how does that work in the cloud? In the cloud, it's using the scheduled task database, is that right? To maintain these, these tasks? I cannot speak how it works in the cloud. But, uh... Well, maybe somebody should should be able to talk about that. So local submit would have to persist in the local object store or something, the thing that you 
whatever was the no it doesn't have to persist on all uh, yeah basically it's so it has to persist for as long as task is running yes and so the value of x is stored on the on the secondary kernel no i don't understand if i do a local submit okay hold on i mean i'm now confused If I do repeated local submits, I don't seem to have an argument to local submit that says submit it to the same task. I mean, local submit is a fire and forget thing. It submits the separately encapsulated task that does what it does. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand how X plus plus can be used as a counter. No, 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 it's correct. So X plus plus evaluates this expression. But uh, X has to be set before the task is running. I know, but it's not a counter because the thing doesn't come back. After the task finishes, the X++ plus plus has returned its value. It can come back through handlers. It can report back uh, any time X, X is increased. I understand that, but I'm saying that it's a one-shot deal. It doesn't yeah. re... Does it? I mean, local submit... No, when the task is finished, it's, it's gone. Yes. Okay, hold on. The X++ case. Mm -hmm. In a scheduled task, the problem is each scheduled task is in general starting from a kernel, which is a fresh kernel. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. But the X that was in that previous kernel is long gone. Unless it persists externally, it, it's long gone. Uh, yes. Okay, so I don't understand what you're talking about. Try session submit of, uh, try to this, x equal to one, and then session submit x plus plus, or print x plus. Oh, I, I know, I, I realize okay. that. I realize that in a session, you have local shared memory. You have access to x, to the value of x. So, a local submit should do the same, except we outsource the execution to a different kernel. But the different kernel has not has no access to this local X, and you cannot pass it there. So, so the only X it could have access to is something persistently stored in the local object store, correct? Currently, yes, but you can you should be able to pass it uh, as initialization. Why not? It doesn't well, have to persist. Listen. I understand that, but you do, how do you reach back? So you do one X plus plus, okay, from one local submitted uh, yeah. task. Yeah. Okay. Now, in that local submit, you may say initialization X equals seven. Yes. Now, after the X plus plus, the initialization should be X equals eight. But you no, have no, 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 there's way. no initialization anymore. It's a, a locally stored X will be will be eight. Yes. Locally stored where? In the task? In the kernel that's running the task. OK, fine. Then you can fire a handler function to report the value back. I understand so, that. But as yeah. soon as that kernel, for whatever reason, I mean, local submit has no guarantee that a particular kernel, a local submit of a scheduled task that's running for a decade, has no guarantee that it's the same kernel that's running every instance of the scheduled task. In local submit, you, it does. No, in what local submit, every task runs in its own kernel. OK, fine. And, fine. Uh, fine. But then again, I'm asking you again the question of how does the value of x get moved between kernels? I don't see how it works. It doesn't. That's, what, that's the whole point. You can't. But the only way you're going to be able to do this is to write an atomic file somewhere that can be reread by a different kernel. No, no. When I when I start the the secondary kernel to run the task, I can pass all the values through MathLink. But there is sorry, no sorry, just, but there is no syntax for that. Wait, 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 wait. When you start the task again, you can pass the values. But how do you get back the most recent values? Through handler functions. Okay, but so the initialization 
but listen, listen, you give the initialization once at the time when you're setting up the task, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So that initialization that you have given cannot be changed. Uh, the, well, the, the initialization is done once before the task is run. You don't have to change it. You, you can change the local variables. Which are what local variables? Local variables, but where are you storing the non-local, the global variables that will be used in these local kernels? Where they stored in the in the in the separate kernel? Okay. No, there's no kernel running. There's no kernel that persistently runs, right? So if you're going to store something long term between kernels, it's got to be stored in a persistent value. No, I think I think you you slightly confusing the issue. There is no persistency here. It's a task that you start, it's done, and it's finished. There is no persistency. Okay, so what does X plus plus do? It will increase the value of x. But what is uh, x? Currently, it will just generate x plus plus infinite as for as long as it's there. It's symbolic. But no, I understand. But how do you give a value for x that currently? Is okay, if you had an initialization option, right? Yeah. Then you say local submit with a scheduled task. You give initialization in the local submit. Yeah, I would say initialization arrow, and then I would say x equal to seven, and that would be passed to the secondary kernel, which would evaluate that. I it understand. Create, yes, which creates an x, which is now eight, but only in the secondary kernel. Yes, yes. So when the secondary kernel dies, the x, which is set to eight, goes poof. Yes, and all yes. That's left is the initialization. Yes, I don't see a problem with that. That's the task. Yes. It's, but yeah, then that's, what that's good what, is it to say x equals 7? Why because, is it, because it can report back using handlers. It could, it okay, could send back Okay, but why isn't it just this? Why aren't you typing x equals 7, x plus plus? Why isn't it equivalent to that? What is the difference between that and saying local submit of x plus plus initialization arrow? Because the whole, the whole expression x equal to 7 semicolon x plus plus is evaluated every time. But you what, what do you mean separate. by every time? Do, do you mean every time in a scheduled task, or you mean every time? Every time the scheduled task is running on the on the second on the uh, uh, second kernel. But yeah. how can it do anything different? Because the different instances of the scheduled task could be separated by a year. It doesn't matter as long as the kernel is running. But the it won't be run running for a day. year. It's not going to be running for a year. For local submit, it has to. Otherwise. It's not that you shouldn't. It's a different issue. For local submit, the kernel is running all the time. I'm so confused. Okay, so you say, given a session, there is a pet kernel that it creates that will be the local submit kernel. Is that right? Yes. A yes. Pet kernel. Okay. So, but the original session dies then its pet dies with it, so to speak. Yes. OK. So I'm totally confused. So within one, I mean, I understand your point now that within one outer session, so to speak, that having an initialization, every time you run local submit, it will ignore the initialization. It's a once, basically. I mean, it is I, I don't a once, yes. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why it's not the same thing as saying, rather than having initialization, saying, you know, once x equals 7, x plus plus. Because I, I, what, what I see is an expression, which is once x, x equal to 7, semicolon x plus plus. And I don't know uh, whether that whole thing should be related once or... But, wait, 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 but, but, but it says, it says... The x equals 7 is evaluated once. The whole thing is evaluated. However, local submit evaluates what it's supposed to evaluate. In the simple application, yes, I can look at once and do that. But in if it's uh, getting more, uh, I'm more not complicated. Buying. Yeah. I'm not buying this. I'm confused. Does anybody else here understand what, what's going on? Have, have you tried to? 
to sell this to to Todd? I it's I did not think I did not invented this. Uh, people came up with it. They said, uh, "How do I initialize X?" And I say, "No way." Okay, I don't think right. I think condition. this is a confusion. I think they should be using once inside their actual code. I mean, I don't think it's necessarily harmful to have this initialization thing, but it's going to be exactly equivalent to using once inside the code. Uh, I think we're trying to invent a mechanism which exists elsewhere because initialization is, uh, is the. Oh, yeah, fine, but once exists elsewhere also. Um, fine. Okay, you know what? Try and sell this to Todd, and we are over time, and we should probably go. And unfortunately, we have in this meeting we have completely failed to de-experimentalize anything. Uh, hopefully... There is another issue with tasks which I would like to bring because I'm trying to bring it up all the time, and it's not working. Yes. Okay, but we're really late, so keep going. Right, it's short. Tasks. Uh, it tells. It gives the list of running tasks. And I think it is wrong that tasks also gives a list of tasks of local tasks and tasks on the cloud, which is cloud object. I think this is wrong. There should be two functions. The reason is that if I do local calculations, which involves evaluating tasks and evaluating something else, it should not reach the cloud every time tasks are evaluated. It should be. It should stay local. So you're arguing for a local tasks and a, and a cloud tasks function. Something like that. Yes. Yeah. I don't have a strong opinion. It doesn't seem obviously wrong. It is. It uh, this design is wrong because reaching for the cloud takes a lot of time, and if I need tasks to be quickly related because I have only one task is running task running, it just slows down the whole computation for no reason. It should be separate. Uh, it doesn't seem obviously wrong to me, but I mean, I don't understand. Maybe we need then a session tasks, a local tasks, a cloud tasks. Or an option to task which would separate, but uh, it should not just blindly report all the tasks. Well, so it could be tasks of cloud or something. Could be, yeah. Or tasks of cloud submit. All right, can, can we bring that up in an? Uh, it's a perfectly sensible thing. Can you get that in another ILD or LCC meeting? Yep, I can bring that up. Okay, all right. Um, so we need some text for why tasks isn't being de experimentalized. And, and this really probably is not well. Oh, uh, everything else is kind of, I haven't seen much use, so I cannot say whether that's uh, working. Well, do you, well I mean, or... you wouldn't necessarily know, but yeah. yes. That's okay. I, yeah, I can complain only about two functions. Okay. All right. Um, um, yeah, by the way, 2N D second. Oh, yeah. Um, second on our live stream is asking, why would you not use local submit instead of session submit if you want to reference a temporary variable? Because session submit, local submit, they run on different kernels. If you use local submit. Right, so local submit is a separate kernel. A separate session kernel. submit is using your session kernel. If you use local submit, that, then you have a reason to use to use local submit. Presumably, yeah, because you want it to run in a in a uh, separately from your main kernel. All right, okay, very good. Um, uh, this meeting was useful, even though we did not successfully de experimentalize anything. Um, all right, thanks to folks here. Thanks to folks on the live stream. Be back a different time. See you later.